Hey everyone, my name is Zach. Welcome to the introductory video on Generative Adversarial Networks, or GANs. This video is meant to give a high-level overview in plain speak, and a follow-up video will dive deeper into the math. Let's get started by explaining each of the terms in the title, Generative, Adversarial, and Network. First, let's explain what we mean by a generative model. Quite simply, this means our model can generate new data samples that look like the training data. So, if you're trying to learn images of faces, a generative model could create new, never-before-seen face images. These are examples of generated, totally fake face images, so these are not real people. But the generative model has learned what faces should look like and can therefore create new examples of them. To wrap our heads around this, let's think of a simpler example, like coin flips. We could specify a generative model of coin flips like this. First, draw a random number between 0 and 1. Then, if the number is greater than 0 0.5, let's say it's heads, otherwise tails. With this, I can simulate coin flips without having to actually flip coins, because I have a reasonable model of the process. Here's two data sets. One is from actual coin flips, and the other from the generative model, as described before. Can you tell the difference? So, this generative model, which consists of pulling a random number and applying a threshold, can give us as many heads and tails examples as we want. Further, the statistical properties of the results, such as the number of observed heads in a thousand trials, would be about equal to real-world coin flipping data. Now let's talk about the adversarial term. The typical example is that of a detective and a counterfeiter. In this case, we have two adversaries. The first is the counterfeiter, which is the generator, and its job is to create fake $1 bills. Next, we have the detective, called the discriminator, and the job of the discriminator is to tell you if a dollar bill is real or counterfeit. We then set up a game and keep track of who's doing a good and a bad job. If the discriminator can easily distinguish between real and fake $1 bills, then we update our generator to do a better job. If the discriminator is failing and can't tell the difference, then we update the discriminator to do a better job. In the beginning, the generator doesn't know anything about making $1 bills, so it just outputs random noise. However, the discriminator also doesn't know anything about $1 bills, so it makes random decisions. But through time, one will do better than the other, and that will lead to us updating the other one to improve. When the training has converged, the discriminator can no longer tell the difference between real and fake data because the generator is creating samples that look identical to real data. This competition in a zero-sum game between two models is what is meant by adversarial. Let's return to our coin flip example. If you recall, I specified in the beginning that the random number would be evaluated against a threshold of 0 0.5. That's because I know that a fair coin has equal probability of showing either heads or tails. But what if I have an unknown coin, and I want to learn a generative model for that? To apply the adversarial framework, you might do the following. It's worth highlighting that this example is constructed to guide your intuition for how the adversarial framework could result in learning, and it is not representative of how GANs are actually implemented. First, we'll generate our fake data. We don't know anything about the coin yet, so let's pick a random threshold of, say, 0 0.2. Next, we'll draw 10 random numbers and apply that threshold to get two heads. Now, let's get real data by flipping our coin and recording the outcomes. Let's say it actually gives heads 70% of the time, so the threshold is 0 0.7. So with 10 flips, you might expect 7 heads. Finally, pass these two data sets into the discriminator to get real and fake labels for each data set. In the beginning, our discriminator has no idea how to tell the difference, so we'll have to pick a random rule. For instance, if the number of heads is greater than or equal to 7, or less than or equal to 3, then we'll say fake, otherwise we'll say real. In this case, the fake data has two heads, so it's appropriately labeled as fake. The real data has seven heads, so it's also labeled as fake. So, the discriminator and generator haven't learned anything yet, but we got started by randomly assigning some parameters. In this example, it turned out that the discriminator correctly identified the fake data as fake, but was incorrect in deciding the real data was also fake. Let's now use these results to update our models. First, we'll deal with the fake data. 
The discriminator was correct, so it doesn't need updating. But that means the generator did a bad job and should be updated. We know that the discriminator gave a fake label because the number of heads was only two. So the signal we send to the generator is, give more heads. So let's update our generator threshold to go from 0.2 to 0.3. Next, we look at the discriminator's decision on the real data. Since the generator is not involved in this process at all, we can ignore it. If the discriminator were correct, there would be nothing to do, but in this case, it made a mistake, so we need to update it. It made a mistake because it thought seven heads were too many to be real, but the real data actually had seven heads. So let's update this upper bound condition on the discriminator to go from greater than equals seven equals fake to greater than equals eight is fake. Now, let's run a second trial with our updated models. So, our generator creates fake data using the new parameters, and now it has three heads out of ten. Let's say our real coin gives us the same data set with seven heads. Now, let's use the discriminator's new parameters to assign labels to each data set. The fake data gets a fake label because it has less than or equal to three heads again. The real data gets a real label because it doesn't violate either of the conditions. In this case, the discriminator was correct in both instances. That means the generator failed in the first case and needs updating. It failed because, once again, it didn't have enough heads. So, once again, we send the signal to generate more heads. So we can update its threshold from 0.3 to 0.4. Since the discriminator was correct in both cases, no updates are required. Okay, one last trial. So with our generator, we create fake data using the new parameters, and we now have four heads. Our real data with the actual coin is the same, and we have seven heads. We now use our discriminator to assign labels to each of the two data sets. Both the fake and real data get real labels. In other words, the generator was successful in fooling the discriminator this time. Since the generator was successful, it does not need updating. However, the discriminator needs to be updated since it incorrectly thought the fake data was real. It failed because it thought four heads were enough to get the label of real. Let's update this lower bound condition on the discriminator to go from less than equal three to less than equal four. If you take a moment to think about the dynamics of this process, the generator starts by giving way too few heads, but slowly increases as the discriminator learns to identify it as being fake for that reason. As the discriminator gets fooled, it learns to increase the lower bound on the acceptable number of heads. Additionally, it learns to relax its condition on the upper bound as it makes mistakes on the real data by calling it fake. So, both the generator and discriminator are getting better by competing, and they're learning to do it by using the real observational data as a reference point. Finally, we get to the term network, which, as you might guess, refers to neural networks. That's simply because both the generator and discriminator are implemented with neural networks. The primary reasons are twofold. One, it's well known that a big enough neural network can approximate just about any function, including very complicated ones like the probability distribution of all face images. Second, there's a well-defined and easy to implement framework for knowing precisely how to tweak a neural network to make it better if you have examples of mistakes it's made. This is the well-known technique of backpropagation. So, there we have it. Generative Adversarial Networks. We can build a generative model of our data, which allows us to create fake samples that look like real samples. By creating this notion of a discriminator, whose job is to tell the difference between our real data and our generated data. To implement this in practice, we feed random numbers into our generator network, and it outputs new fake samples. We then feed these samples along with real samples into the discriminator and ask it to tell us which is which. By implementing these two models as neural networks, we can use the familiar paradigm of backpropagation to guide us in updating the models efficiently given the errors. 
So that's the high level of how GANs work. Tune into part two for a deeper dive. Thanks for watching.